Now we've interacted on a listserv. That's yeah. quite old. That's old school. And on Facebook a lot. Nowhere yes. else though, I don't think. I think that's pretty much No. Old. No, nowhere else. Now you're a prolific Facebook person. Yeah, I, I do kind of uh I kind of live there. I'm all I'm usually in front of the computer. Uh hey, before I get too far into this podcast, I should make some introductions. Let me start with today's theme, social media. It's a huge part of society. It's changing the way we think and act. And according to Robert Wicks, this element of the evolution of communications technology is not merely driving current events. It could be driving history towards less state power. Robert argued this on Facebook recently, and I thought it an important and challenging insight. So I asked him to elaborate his ideas here. In the conversation, he mentions IP. He's talking about intellectual property. He's against it. He has reasons. We don't discuss them at length. Robert is a Linux systems engineer who lives on the other side of the continent from me in Atlanta, Georgia. He has been a libertarian for over 15 years, and I've been one since 1980. My name is Timothy Vergala, and this is the Local Foco Netcast. We were talking about Facebook, and we were talking about listservs, which we were also on. Uh, in fact, we are kind of in the orbit of Stefan Kinsella regarding yes. listservs. Yes, 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 we are kind of all in that orbit, uh, which is which is kind of a fascinating thing, too, because, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of people on Facebook and and some of them have wildly different opinions and some of them, quite frankly, hate each other. Uh, so it's always kind of interesting seeing the interactions among people I'm like, oh, OK, I didn't realize that was some sort of a sore spot. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Well, I mean, I even see it on your page every now and then. I, I see oh, yeah. I see a little friction. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People will say things, you know, generally speaking, I'll, I'll avoid making much in the way of commentary. I'm I'm a lot more interested in finding out what people think and getting the feel for how many people think it and then kind of understanding the why's after I get an understanding of the what. I'm much more of a what guy than a why guy, because I've never been one of those people who's a fan of trying to project what's going on in people's heads, because, I mean, I really can't know. And, uh, you know, and that's one of those things that I see people constantly doing. They're always projecting what somebody else is thinking. And it's like, you know, and, it's, and I'm looking at stuff sometimes. I'm like, I can think of three different things that would explain exactly what you're seeing that doesn't have anything to do with what you're saying. It's like, <laughs> why would you just jump there? <laughs> yeah, well, and I'm in that camp. I mean, I, I uh, we all make prejudiced judgment yeah, of course we do. Well, you have to you have to do that in order to work through life. But, it's, you know, my thing is like, not so much sometimes that you have these feelings and thoughts, but I'm like, what on earth made you just want to express it right here? It's like, you know, that's that's the weird thing. It's like, okay, I, I can get having all kinds of thoughts and, uh, you know, things that, you know, might keep private, but like, why would you just want to say that publicly? That just seems so, so bizarre. And the other thing, of course, when it comes, especially when it comes to like projecting people's thoughts and stuff, one of the reasons, one of the big reasons I avoid it is that anytime you express that kind of opinion, you now have this big ego investment in being right. Sure, and sure. that means that if you have additional information that comes down the line that's like, okay, that's kind of contrary to what I was thinking, you now have this real big impediment into just saying, okay, I was wrong about that. Because you have this ego investment and everybody knows that your ego is not invested in this thing. So I try to avoid getting into that trap. I'm usually pretty good about saying that I'm wrong, but you know, why, why strain a rope if you don't have to? <laughs> You bring up a lot of controversial topics on Facebook, yet you do manage to stay out of the dirt of it. Which yeah, is... I, yeah, yeah, that, that, is, that is something that I've kind of worked at. And part of that has to do with my own personality in that I'm not an extremely emotional guy. I don't, I don't tend to get my emotions involved in most things. I, um, I'm much more of a, okay, this is the thing that is happening. So if I want to bring about this result, what do I need to do? Rather than how does this make me feel? You know, that's that's much less of a thing for me. So so a lot of times, you know, I'll hear people say things um, on Facebook that I find completely abhorrent. But I'm like, OK, well, let's see. Let's see where this goes. You know, let's see why it is you're saying this. What does it mean? What you know, or, and, or perhaps my initial impression of what it is you're saying is not actually accurate. You know, it may be that what you're saying is not really what I thought it was. So and that's another reason not just jump in and attack someone, because sometimes people are saying things and maybe they're a little clumsy about it. Or maybe it's just because my own biases that I'm interpreting in a certain way and it shouldn't be interpreted as something 
you know, abhorrent, you know, that, that maybe there's a lot more nuance to this. So, you know, that's something that, that I can certainly do on Facebook, although I know this, that a lot of people don't, you know, and that, well, it kind of makes me sad, but I recognize that that is how, you know, most, most people, you know, the emotions kind of lead. One thing I don't do is start calling people names. That, yes, that that's something I don't really even understand why you would or or tell somebody you're an e- you're you're an awful person why you exist things like you're I a see fascist that. you're a Nazi you're a racist like literally I w- I won't even call racist racist because it shuts down the conversation to flesh out the flesh out what it is they're talking about because the best way to expose someone who really has an abhorrent idea is to kind of talk to them and let them kind of flesh out their abhorrent idea if it's really bad it'll be pretty apparent yeah true and then of course which kind of racism are we talking about. Yeah, well, that's that's a very that's a very important thing to to make a distinction of. You know, everybody has all their own little definitions of of racism. I tend to go with a very hardcore libertarian stance on it in terms of uh, you know I, I always deal with things in terms of rights. Uh, you know, if you believe that other races have different rights have, 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 than than one race, then that's a functional type of racism that you can have action on. You know, but if you like, if you just prefer a race. I mean, why would I care if you prefer to race? Everybody does, I would imagine. <laughs> you know, for certain, depending and, and, on what it is you're doing. Hey, right, exactly. In different spheres, you may have yeah, a preference. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. certain, I'm sure that certain people would prefer specific races for their mates. And by the way, that's not always the same the same race that it you is, are. It is certainly not so, always so, the same race. So, you know, and these are things that you, that you, that, you know, people have, have every right to do. That doesn't mean that they hate you or they think that you're less of a human being or you have fewer rights or anything like that. It's a preference. It's like, you know, to me... It, it in those in that sense, it's no different from saying, you know, I prefer chocolate to strawberry. I mean, that's not making a moral judgment on it. That's just a preference. Right. One of the controversial things in our circles, no, not in our circles, but let's just say on the margins of our circles, <laughs> uh, is the idea of free association and being able to form your own community and exclude others that you don't like. So we've just said, you know, it doesn't bother me if you don't want to deal with me or, you know, what, what would that, you know, what... Just as long as you're not going to shoot me. Yeah, as long as you're not trying to hurt me or violate my rights and whatnot. If you want to live to yourself, you know, I mean, the Amish do it now. And almost nobody accuses the Amish of being hateful people who are trying to do something to someone. You know, even though they do have a fairly exclusive sort of uh, sort of of arrangement. And, you know, so you can you can absolutely have those kinds of feelings. I think that one of the things that happens in the United States is that those things have so often been mixed with the state and have usually been mixed with the state and they've been mixed with, uh, with the state in some, some particularly horrifying ways. Um, so that kind of thing becomes a, a very touchy subject because anytime you start talking about any kind of racial issue, there's always that underlying fear that somehow this leads to to Bull Connor opening up hoses on people, and or or um, or you not having the functional right to um to own and keep your property, you know, because we have fairly recent historical examples of that kind of thing. You know, all those things are within living memory. My parents are both technically silent generation um, in that they were born during World War II. Um, you know, although you know most of the attitudes would be more boomerish, but the thing, you know, I'm I'm from a rural area. Um, which is somewhat, somewhat, uh, my background, as I have found over the years, is actually a lot more unusual than I thought it was, because I am from a rural area, and there's a number of black people from rural areas, but it was a weird kind of set of circumstances where I'm from a, a very rural area in the Jim Crow South in Mississippi, but, and it was all black, basically, in that area, but all of those black people were landowners and not sharecroppers. And I think that actually has a very large impact on how I think about things. Um, and I did not really appreciate that until I was talking about it with my father, because he was mentioning that the people in our little community were some of the very few black landowners, that most people had been sharecroppers. And that kind of helped me kind of think, OK, well, that would explain why when a lot of blacks went to the cities, they didn't. Have, they didn't. A lot of times, they didn't concentrate on on owning property or things like that. They'd be, you know, you'd have. I mean, there are people now who are like fourth generation renters. They've never owned it really anything. They've always been. They've always rented and things like. And and that that affects 
how you think about things that affects how you how you how you think about long term investment. Lots of things that that you know I kind of took as a given growing up that um, that these are the things you do. This is how you behave because you know my family owned land. They wanted to keep it. Um, it was very difficult to amass resources, so you didn't want to be expending resources in things like you know bailing people out of jail and stuff like that. So, being very careful about your behavior was extremely important. And because I, you know I had this kind of a fairly well established family structure, that also meant that I took some personal pride in like just even having my last name. I never wanted to embarrass my father or my grandfather. So you know, so I think a lot of people didn't have that kind of attitude. You know, that reminds me of uh, one of the commandments in the book of Exodus, honor thy father and thy mother. And sometimes I think people think that it means just treating them well. Yes. But that's not really it, is it? Because really, no. you, you just mentioned what it is. It's yes. It's not yes. dishonoring the family. Not dishonoring them. Yeah, you know, I, I never wanted it to be said, you know, I, I would never want my any of my, my, my parents or, or my grandfather to, you know, say, you know, you know, Robert Wicks, your son, your grandson, let me tell you what he did. It'd just be something terrible. It's like that. I mean, I would really feel bad about that. So, yeah, that was that's the kind of thing that that, uh, you know, those communal bonds are things that I mean, that's what makes for good communities and good neighborhoods more so than a lot of uh, the real superficial things. Now, those things are typically tied to property because it is the property that's being carried on from one generation to the next. That's one of the reasons why you do those things. And I think that a lot of times, um, a lot of times people's morals to me kind of, it resembles kind of what people's ideas on fiat currency. You kind of start with gold and you have this thing that people value for whatever other properties that they have that are non-monetary and you use it for money. And then you just kind of boot, you just kind of say, well, we can just replace this with something that doesn't have any of that underlying understanding. And we can just kind of use it the same way. And that works for some time because people have habits. But at some point you get to the point where those things that 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 were underneath the original the 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 original cultural values are actually important. They, I mean, otherwise people just won't continue doing. People won't just continue doing something when they see that it doesn't provide some sort of a tangible benefit. This is something we have in common because I'm also a rural person. I actually live in the in the country right now. Now you live in the city, right? Yeah, big city guy. I mean, it's and it's a major, yeah, major Atlanta, city in the yeah. United States, right? Yeah, Atlanta, I mean, okay. not, you know, yeah, that's where I am. Okay, you know, which not not uncommon. <laughs> so we just talked about property as sort of an undergirding of community and society in general, and that's certainly my view of the world too. But for a lot of people in this country and in the world in the first world today, it is the government. It's not that's what that's what undergirds everything. I mean, if you don't get your check. If you don't get your subsidy of some sort, then that's a, an awfully big threat to you. Yes. Um, so that's a different li mindset and would be completely different from how I think of the world. Yeah. And, and the same here, you know, and, 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 you know, one of the things I try to do on Facebook is to understand that mindset and um, to try to think, OK, I don't think that that, you know, just you know, this, this sort of forceful way of doing things ultimately is going to be successful in the modern world. Uh, you know, I know one of the things that we had talked about uh, on Facebook before that also kind of prompted this was talking about communications and how it uh, undermines uh, a lot of the things that the state can do. You know, I think that, that um, you know, historically the state exists for a reason. And people have always come back to having these kinds of structures everywhere you see in the world. It's not an irrational thing. When you are living in a world, I think that we discount ignorance. And when I say ignorance, I don't mean it in the sense of you, you defaming someone you know, for being ignorant. What I'm saying is that in the, in, in the very recent past, most people were ignorant of almost everything happening in the world at any time, almost everything. And I don't think you can really discount that. When you are living somewhere and there might be Genghis Khan or some other genocidal army on the, uh, you know, coming over the mountain and you have, you have no way of knowing whatsoever. Those things are, and you, but you've seen uh, the evidence of what they have done. Those things are going to affect human behavior. So when you are living in a world where 
where genocide travels at the speed of a horse, and so does news of the genocide at the speed of a horse, as well as any sort of ability for you to organize defenses also travels at the speed of a horse. And when you're living in that kind of a world, that means that you have to have your defenses up in advance. That's one of the main reasons, I think, why the first mover advantage was much bigger deal in the past. You know, Germany was the first mover in World War II, but they lost. One of the reasons why is because they didn't have the kind of advantages that first movers had in the past, where if you were the first mover, you know, 500 years ago, by the time they even got word of what was happening, they wouldn't have really good good uh, word of what was happening. You wouldn't have good descriptions because you're in the middle of the fog of war. You got to try to organize things to attack what you think is happening, but you can't really know all that well. You're only getting very isolated reports. That's a very chaotic sort of system. It makes a lot of sense in that environment where the the negative outcome is that you, your wife, your kids, everybody slaughtered. It makes a lot of sense for you to say, okay, well, we're going to organize and have this permanent army. And and in fact, not only are we not going to just sit around and wait to defend ourselves, we're going to conquer all the territory around us to make sure that we've cleared out of space. That makes complete that makes complete sense when you think about it from the standpoint of just living through the fog of ignorance. Now, we look at those kinds of people in the past and we look at them kind of record with horror now. But uh, but you have to kind of take that into account that when you have that level of ignorance, I mean, what you know, there's not a lot of things that that uh, there's not a lot of things you can do. I'm sure that there were people in the past who lived by much more libertarian principles than the people who won. But there's a reason we don't hear about. It. Yeah, I suppose yeah. so. Um, when the Mongol horde came to Hungary. Uh, the first time they were very successful, but they had to leave. And when they came back, the king or whoever he was, they made just castle after castle and fort after fort. And the, the Mongols had they had they had no success. They actually right. lost in Hungary the second time. Yes, and then that's exactly that's exactly what I mean. So, so when you look at that, and when I look at the previous kind of communications revolutions, where, where you start with the printing press. Um, you know, these things put strains on the existing state structures because the state is built on, essentially, it's built on the fact that you're ignorant of most things. So you have to have this coordinated action. You have to have this centralized control in order to coordinate that action because you don't really have any effective way otherwise. You don't have this person-to-person -person communication. There would be no no uh, me and you speaking across thousands of miles and, and coordinating actions if we wanted to do something. It has to be done through some sort of centralized authority. So you so you end up having you know kings and all of these sorts of things, and. You know, so when you get the printing press, that puts strains on that because now all of a sudden this sort of centralized command and control, the centralized um, dissemination of knowledge is broken a bit. Now, I think that because of the expense uh, and relative rarity, it only puts strains on state structures. But then you get, you know, later on, you get some additional strains where now we have faster travel. We have, you know, and, and, and especially when you start talking about la the end of last century and this century, you have faster travel. You have things like, you know, telegraph and radio. So now you have you have instantaneous communications, but it's still pretty expensive. So not everybody has it. So you still have you still have a lot of need for this sort of centralized uh, dissemination of knowledge. But then once we get to the cell phone era, I think that that has radically changed everything. So now we have where any group or subgroup has the ability to essentially coordinate action in this, with the same level of effectiveness as a state used to. And that's never been true in human history. I think that that, is, that might end up being the single most important civilization change, maybe ever. It's certainly any time recently. I mean, that, that's a massive change. It completely undermines, in a lot of ways, the reasons why people have always valued the state. And I think that the state is going to have to either adapt to the new reality or maybe it'll go away. I mean, I, I can't, I certainly wouldn't be one to predict that kind of thing, but we may be on the verge of having essentially states that are the states in name only and a bunch of, you know, corporations that actually do everything. It could very well be something like that. I don't think the state would go away in name just because people associate certain emotions with it and things like that, but it's certainly possible for the state to go away in the sense of it having real power, um, that is that is that is something I could actually see happen. 
That's a very interesting idea. There are many social scientists who are wondering about what the nation state is going to evolve to, because the nation state as a concept isn't even that old re- either. I mean, no. There were different kinds of states a, a thousand years ago. Uh, right. Very different kinds of states. Like hard borders and things like that. Yeah. Was fairly, yeah. Fairly recent. That may be one of the things that goes first, is the hard border. Um, because co-territoriality might become an, a possibilities. Because, just like you said, because of the possibility of communication. Yeah. And, you know, now, especially with things like blockchaining and, you know, so we, we, we're, we're entering an era where you not only have these communications, but you're able to have... Um, you're able to have you're able to have secure communications. You're able to have to a lot of times recognize people or verify your identification in a way that is very difficult, if not impossible, to to falsify. And in that kind of environment, it may very well be that that you know, kind of the territorial border doesn't really even make a lot of sense. You know, I could certainly see, I could certainly see city states um, within within state you as american states right now i mean that's not very difficult for me to imagine even now with this with the uh covid 19 response here in georgia you know you have this tension between the mayor of atlanta who wants to maintain this lockdown and the governor who wants to open things up and you have um the state having having sovereignty essentially over the over the city the city does not have the right to over to uh, overturn any sort of state edicts but it's quite reasonable to me, when I'm looking at it, I'm like, OK, assuming that we just we, we accept the legitimacy of the state. So I'm not uh, so I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to eliminate the libertarian, quote unquote, argument now. Why would it make sense that that the city of Atlanta would be governed in the same way as most of the state of Georgia? Right. I mean, most of the state of Georgia is rural. So the idea that the same requirements are there just doesn't strike me as a reasonable thing to say at all. I mean, they would, they would have very different kinds. You know, rural Georgia would be a lot more similar to rural Alabama or rural Mississippi than it is to Atlanta. Exactly. I also have uh, a tendency to formally compromise and consider, you know, non-radical, non-libertarian ideas uh, as perhaps ways forwards or as solutions to, you know, obvious contemporary problems one of them would be just to, to actually secede out to to to, to uh, is to take new york state from new york boroughs mm-hmm. chicago most of illinois people hate chicago and they really feel put upon because of chicago because chicago politics it's like that in oregon there's a oregon and washington both have movements to where the rural areas want to secede from the metropolitan areas and and california the big cities i mean Los Angeles is, is is a state. I mean, it's it's bigger than most, in population terms, bigger than most states. So why shouldn't it be a state separate from the rest? Yeah, I I, I agree with that. I think that that you know the fear, of course, of that of that phrase, states' rights, is is something that that has to be grappled with. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the arguments that libertarians and uh, conservatives have made just do not resonate with with black people. Um, you know, when we start talking about, um, you know, how the country was supposed to be in terms of it being a republic and republics protect rights, black people really cannot say that. Black people's rights were, were severely infringed under the much more Republican form prior to Lincoln than it was after, you know, and, and you can't just dismiss it. You know, uh, now you can you can say that, okay that can't happen again. And a lot of these things, I think, can't happen again precisely because of those communications. You know, one of the reasons why outrages, things that we consider outrages now would occur in the past and be and persist in the past, because not a lot of people would know. it. You know, certainly not enough people to where you could say, okay if if, if a billion people know about this bad thing you're, you're doing, even if the folks right close to you don't want to do anything about it, the people far away might just wait. And that's largely what I think happened with Jim Crow. Jim Crow was able to endure the radio era, but it it, it died in the television era. And then I do not think that was at all an accident. Um and because you you had people close by, OK, maybe those people say, well, it's not worth me trying to tick off these rich guys who are doing this thing or the state doing this thing. But the federal government saying, well, I don't have any investment in your state and I don't like what it is you're doing. And, you're, and you know, and that that is actually a reality that everybody has to deal with, that 
that the actions that you engage in, how they make other people feel does matter. You actually have to take into account, and this is something that, that I think libertarians and anarchists have to think about too, that if you are engaging in something which is technically libertarian, however, it inspires the kind of rage in other people where they will decide that they will resort to crime, you have to take that into consideration before you start doing it. And what would you? What were you thinking about? What kind of? What are you talking well, about? Well, I mean, like, uh, if you, it, I mean, if you were to talk about, um, let's see, something that that is that is libertarian, but people don't like it. I would say, if you're if you're running, uh, man, if you're running drug dens uh, where you're you're targeting. Uh, teenagers and you're trying to get them hooked on drugs and things like that. No, teenagers have the ability to make decisions. But if people see you doing that kind of stuff on a regular basis, even if it was in under some sort of situation where the state did not forbid it, they might just do something to you. And you can't undo a crime. Somebody puts a bullet in you, that bullet is there, whether or not you, you had the right to do what it is you're doing. You have to take that into account. You can't you can't just dismiss the anger that you inspire in other people by certain things you do, especially the things that you do publicly. You have to that, that's all a part of living in a real world with other human beings. And, you, you know, we can't atomize things so much that we forget that you live in a world with other people. And those people are going to react to what you do. Some of their reactions may be just or unjust, but whether they're just or unjust, they are still there. And you have to take into account that, that this unjust thing actually happened. And this unjust thing will have consequences. You can't actually undo an injustice. So if someone commits an injustice against you, it is done. Even if there is some sort of uh, some sort of reparation towards you, it will not undo the original. That's um, an important point. I think that many people forget. In fact, almost everybody forgets that. Almost everybody. That's across all ideological lines. <laughs> um, and I, I've always—it's an asymmetry. I mean, we talk about justice. You know, when the state provides it or the law provides it or a policeman provides it or even if your pr private protection agency provides it. But that's compensatory and can't do the whole thing because there's no restitution for a lost life. No, none whatsoever. So 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 all of those things are, are things you have to take into account when you when you start acting in the real world. I think that there's going to be some surprises kind of on across ideological spectrums, because I think that a lot of the people who are upset by say, cancel culture, uh, might be, be upset to find out that it wouldn't go completely away even without the state. There, there, if people don't like what it is you, you say, then morally they have the right to not have anything to do with it. You know, if they want to boycott your products, that's completely fine. The problem, I would say, in terms of modern cancel culture, ends up really being how the state interacts with it so that it cuts off lots of options. And a lot of that stuff, quite frankly, going back to our, our earlier mentioning of Stephen Kinsella, is intellectual property and similar kinds of laws. So you have intellectual property. One of the things I, I put into this kind of same broad um, category would be things like broadcast licensing, media licensing, all those things that tend to consolidate media and consolidate communication and prevent you from copying off of them or doing something uh, as an alternative saying, hey, you know, this is a better Twitter. You I mean, there's no reason morally why you shouldn't be able to say, hey, you know, less toxic quit Twitter dot com. But, you know, obviously, IP would prevent you from doing that. Uh, but it is precisely that ability to push back that actually limits some of the effects of, of cancel culture. Now, there are certainly going to be certain certain things, certain people, certain ideas that if you're if these are the things you're promoting, then almost nobody's going to want to deal with it. And you're going to have to be on the outskirts of society if that is if that is what you want. And well, if that's what you want. That's what you want. Well, I mean, uh, there's, there's always a few religions. There's always a few sexual practices. There's always mm -hmm. a few drug practices. And there's always, you know, well, it's your hates and your loves. Uh, there's some loves and lots of hates that are going to mm -hmm. be hated. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and those are things that, you know, we just have to deal with. Um, but, you know, kind of going back to the to the the whole communication thing, I think that that the ability for us to communicate with one another instantly in that way means that there's going to be a lot more things that various people are going to be irritated by. They may say things may say things to you. And to a large degree, you have to learn how to kind of, you know, just 
let that wash off your back. Now, one another problem is that the way that the economy has been, I guess, corporatized, that does become something of a problem. I, I, I think that PC culture really is corporate culture. Um, when you're when you're in a uh, kind of a multinational corporation, a very large corporation, you have to have very vanilla, plain Jane rules that are as the, the least offensive as possible, so that you can be the most productive possible. You can't. You don't really want to inspire passions when you're in a corporation. Uh, you want things to be very predictable. You want things to operate very smoothly. You want people to have have be able to have expectations of how encounters go and to have those expectations met. So the things that we kind of identify as politically correct to me are simply corporate norms. And I don't think that those corporate norms would ever go away. I, I want to give some pushback right there. Okay, because go ahead. In the older days, mm -hmm. I'm older than you, but by a half a generation or something, um, the general corporate idea was to not offend anyone. Mm -hmm. You you just didn't say things about sex. You didn't say things of, of weird politics. I mean, I didn't talk about my... I was developing my politics when I was working for a, a big company. Right. And I didn't talk about it very much. Right. Yes. And, but now we have... And they never... The, the company never foisted any bizarre or sp specific religious or social norm or social activity. Now they're doing that often in the big corporations. They are yeah, saying one think, kind of thing is going to happen. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that I, I would say that, yes, you are correct in terms of the very recent kind of SJW uh, stuff is something that I think has come about just because you had enough of those people who got into power in the corporate world and you have enough restrictions on on new entrants into the market to where it doesn't really cost them anything. And those are things that I absolutely do think that should be pushed back against. But one of the problems I find a lot of times with the right is that they don't want to address those underlying concerns because they're, I think they're probably seeing this anti-business to say that, you know, that, that, um, that, that corporations, um, that, that corporations have too much power based on some actual laws that are on the books. Like I said, I really do think that IP is actually underappreciated here um, because Apple can get away with being an SJW because nobody can go out and make um, an iPhone. They can't make an iPhone compatible device and say, you know what, if you don't like Apple, come use our thing. It's going to work uh, the exact same way, interact with all of your stuff the same way that Apple will shut it down. You know, it's not like Apple would just say, okay, well, we're going to cut off our servers or, you know, stuff that they, they would naturally have the power to do. No, they'll come after you in court. And that is actually a very significant wealth and power concentrator. And I think that if you start talking about it pushing things into a, a, a what people would broadly call a leftward direction, it's going to certainly have that effect because your creatives, your outliers, your outside the box thinkers tend to be leftists. I mean, it's, it's kind of how their brains work. So when you have any sorts of laws that are going to artificially empower them, then by definition, you're, you're magnifying their voices. You're magnifying their economic power. So there's not the sort of natural tension that you would have between more conservative and more liberal, because that's, that should always be a continuous uh, kind of tug of war. I, um, I think that a lot of times our best freedom ends up being in in these areas where people are competing for hearts and minds. Now, nobody wants to live in a war zone, a physical war zone, but living in the intellectual war zone is actually kind of where you find your most freedom. Right now, there are war zones in some of the major cities. It, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. live like 100 miles from Portland, Oregon, and I haven't been there. I have not visited the notorious section, a few blocks where it's, where there's they're gone crazy. I mean, I see I see pictures and it looks to me like why is that going on? But, you know, you know what's going on. I mean, we all know an element of that, but that's a huge element in much of the political conflict right now. And how do you think communication is aiding and abetting or working against it? Well, I mean, it's certainly allowing people to to coordinate a lot of a lot of those uh, actions as far as the rioters and blocking up traffic and things along that line, um, you know, that that kind of coordinated action from a non-state entity really wouldn't have been possible in the fairly recent past. So, yeah, it's certainly allowing that. And I don't think that there's any, there's no way that old systems are going to 
to come down or be reorganized in a way that is not somewhat stressful. Uh, I would say that compared to the social revolutions of the past, this one has been pretty tame. As you know, we don't have uh, we don't have eight hundred thousand dead people. Uh, you know, people being slaughtered in their beds. Uh, and I don't think that that would, as a realistic thing, happen. I think, especially um, given that, for the most part, the the SJW folk are fairly anti-gun. Um, they're certainly not the sort of we're going to organize ourselves and go door to door and slaughter everyone in this area. They're they're not that kind. And there have been plenty of people who've been like that before. So so I I do I am a lot more I guess you could say long term optimistic in in that sense. I do think that it's it'll look ugly uh, from time to time, and I think that that states are going to have to figure out, okay, well, how do we react to 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 this kind of mass unrest? Um, I think that it is important to talk about exactly what it is that these people want and addressing those points one by one. And that's one of those things that because we have this sort of sort of media monopoly, um, mostly. I mean. It, the we don't hear a lot of that outside of social media, you know, getting your getting your news. You can get you can get much better news from social media than you can from CNN or even Fox or anything like that. You know, it's like for people who are more of the right wingers, you know, that that those things have their own slants on things. And and sometimes they agree a lot more than I think a lot of people might realize, because oh, some who, who agrees? Some, who agrees? Oh, your Fox and your CNNs. Oh, OK. Yeah. You know, those guys, they, you know, they're both big media companies. They, they both kind of, their bread is buttered uh, from similar factions and, uh, and, the, and they value having kind of the tension, the opposition to one another. I mean, that, that's in that, that helps them to generate revenue. So, yeah. So, so much have, of modern media seems to be ragging on the other media. Yeah. Which is weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you, I think that maybe that's just a testament to relatively, how good we have it. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot more things to talk about than what the other news station is doing, you know, 80 years ago. A lot more to talk about. So, so I think that that, that does kind of in, indicate how relatively few and minor, uh, in, in the historical context at least, the problems that we have today are. I think that we're in a better position now to have decentralization and freedom of association that we ever have because we have the ability to to say okay if we have these these in, these incidents where people are uh doing these local outrages we have the ability to let people know very quickly that hey this is ridiculous and this is what's happening right here this is what this person is doing um those things are important checks on on power and when i say power in this sense i don't just mean government power i mean people who have influence uh, or, or whatever that that you know, moderating their behavior, having having a light shone on them is actually a good thing. And we have the ability to shine lights everywhere. You know, everybody can shine a light. You know, um, the the other thing I think actually we had mentioned on Facebook was that uh, you know, one of the reasons why the 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 governments are being strained now is that we've had what amounts to a a, a population explosion. That's kind of what what the modern world looks like. OK, now you have to explain that very carefully. <laughs> well, in the past, the number of people who had any ability to impact the politics of the, the regime under which they lived was very small. Um, during my parents' era in the Jim Crow South, there were basically no blacks among that, that number. And the vast majority of whites weren't among that number. Um, so you would have a very few people who could say, you know, I want this thing done, and it would either get done or be considered. It would be among the things that would be seriously considered to be to be done. You know, they would have that level of influence. Um, that changed radically in the social media era. So now, basically, every every American and something, and I'm not even going to just say adult Americans. It could even be kids. Is basically a viral video or a viral post away from having an actual political impact. So now, instead of you having this sort of stable political population of X number of people, and like I said, I'm not sure what that X number is, but it's certainly not that large. This number of people who have real ability to be heard, 
to have their ideas considered, to possibly have them implemented, to negotiate with other people to, to see how those things are going to be done. We have we have it going from that to being, you know, it might be 100 times that many people now who have the ability at any given time to have that kind of impact. But the thing is, it's not a static number. So you had this X in the past, and now instead of you having, it's not really like you went from uh, the population of X to 100 X. It's almost like you went from the population of X to now we're just going to choose randomly out of 100 X. So it's a very kind of unknowable, tenuous situation because you have this huge political population, but not not all of them actually have influence. But you don't know which ones don't, and which ones do. Right, and, and that could change because, like you say, it could be totally you good. would have no influence on day one, and on day seven, all of a sudden you have tremendous influence. Yes, all of a sudden you can go, you know, you can go from being, uh, you know, just a complete nobody to being. One of the most, you know, one of the, you know, one or two thousand most powerful people in the country in a matter of days, you know, just because of the influence that you have, depending on what has happened and and and, and how you've been able to uh, to to be promoted, and uh, or promote yourself really, because that's the thing, you don't really have to necessarily depend on gatekeepers to promote you, which is what has always been in the past, in the recent media past, you know, that you always had these gatekeepers who would decide who they would promote and who they wouldn't, and now. The social social media, because they don't um, they don't um, they don't really police their platform in that way. That's not the case. So now you have this 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 huge un, un, unknowable population. This 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 population that you cannot really get a census on. You can't you can't know exactly how many are there. You can't know who they are. They change all the time, and, and so. You kind of have to treat everybody as if they are politically important, which you never used to have to do. So when you're living in a world where that is the case, states aren't set up to do that. I mean, they just aren't. The best the best places to set up to do that uh, is, the, is private enterprise. Private enterprise has to teach, treat each of their customers as important because, I mean, that's how they make money. So... I don't think that the the state structures for dealing with this kind of thing really are are too good for that. I think that the I think that private enterprise may be the only thing that can go forward in the post um, social media world. I, we may that's that's another reason why I'm saying that it may be that this is kind of the death knell for the state as far as it being anything seriously important. Uh, you know, it, it might become like some of these countries where you have the um, you know, where you have a prime minister and the president, the president doesn't really have any power. It could be where the state is kind of, okay, well, the state's there. There's still a state there, but doesn't really have any power. I mean, I could easily see that happen. The major corporate <laughs> media, however, they're losing power, right? They see yeah. them losing power. And that's one of the reasons they have so blatantly sided with certain groups that are kind of riotous. Yeah. Are, and, th I mean, and that's one of the reasons for the freak out for everybody because many people liked the old media, right? They, 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 they had allegiances to their media sources. And I think that's true of left and right, by the way. I mean, yes. you know, like the right, a lot of times rags on it, but when I hear the rights complaints about, about how things are now compared to the past, I'm like, what you're really complaining about is the fact that the media doesn't, doesn't, doesn't control narratives anymore. So we don't have this sort of unifying media experience anymore. That's what you're complaining about. You're complaining about big media. <laughs> yeah. Not oh, yeah. Big, yeah. Big. And in a sense, I mean, the right has been doing that for a long time. And our our clad libertarians, we've never had really much of anything. I mean, you know, it's it's this is we're still a very young movement, I think. And, and to some degree, I would say that that libertarianism is kind of uh, it's kind of it, it does. I think it does fit better in the social media uh, kind of age because. When you try all of these things and all these things don't work and people are upset by things, at some point, you know, you have to say, well, maybe the solution is not going for any of these one size fits all solutions because they just don't work. Not anymore. You can't shut up enough people to make them work. Realistically, no modern state could have, uh, you know, mass eth ethnic cleansing and, and, and genocide. It would completely undermine their their their, their uh, their legitimacy, they would go under immediately as soon as they tried it. They probably would have rebellion within their own ranks, you know, because so so we don't live in the same era of, uh, you know, of Stalin and and uh, or Hitler. So 
we need to, you know, we shouldn't really pretend that we do. That That's not the world that we live in. We don't live in a world where the president can order all Japanese Americans on the on the West Coast to be held in camps. That's that's not the world we live in. It could not happen. I mean, if you, if, I mean, that would be, <laughs> I think that they would probably storm the White House. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, it just could not happen. So, so living in a world where, okay, because of the, the, the infrastructure that we have, the ability that we have to talk to one another, these things aren't possible. What things are possible? What things, what things, and I think that most of the things that actually are possible are either good or morally neutral. Um, and so I, I look to move more in that, more in that direction. And that's kind of why I operate on Facebook the way that I do, because I really want to know what people think uh, more so than get upset with people. You know, I mean, I got, I got Facebook friends who, uh, I would say are not racially enlightened, so we put it uh, mildly. And, uh, you know, but I still listen to what they have to say because they do represent what people actually think and some of the concerns they have. And, and, and some concerns that people have, even if they make you uncomfortable, okay, it's still not an unreasonable concern. And so, okay, well, how can we deal with that concern without bringing about all of these negatives that go along with it? You know, and that, that's kind of one of the things I'm always looking to try to think about. Yeah. Now, we're dealing with an interesting subject, in part because the Libertarian Party is running a you know, presidential candidate again. And she had a, a kind of infamous uh, Twitter, what would you call that? Whatever that was. Uh, yeah. I guess I should mention what it was. I mean, she basically says it's not enough to be not be racist, but you must be actively anti-racist. And a lot of libertarians found this objectionable. Yeah, I think that maybe the objectionable part was when she put the, the hashtag Black Lives Matter, because as soon as you use a slogan or a symbol, and that, that phrase is, at this point is, has become a symbol, then whatever people associate with it is now part of that symbol. That's, that's what happened with the Confederate flag. When I grew up in the rural South, the Confederate flag didn't have any special racist connotations. It was what I considered it to be was mostly white and Southern. If you were white and your ancestors went back in the South, that's kind of what you had. So it wasn't my flag. But I didn't really but I didn't really associate it with, okay, if I go around this person with a Confederate flag, they might hurt me. That was never really a thought of mine. Uh, when I moved to the city, then the people who were flying that flag were very different from where I was coming from. They weren't, they were pretty hostile to blacks as a general rule um, in the city, when you start talking about in and around the city, because the symbol had different meanings. And Black Lives Matter is 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 both the slogan, you know, that, you know, black lives do matter. I mean, certainly I believe that I'm black. Everybody who I associate with, for the most part, is black. Uh, but then it's also an organization. And that organization has has certain things that it promotes that I completely am opposed to. And lots of libertarians are completely opposed to. And once you use that slogan, then all of a sudden, depending on who you're talking to, they're going to associate it the way that they want to associate it. The people who take it as being, um, you know, in the what I would call the more benign that, OK, that, you know, that these people's lives matter. They might say, OK, you know, that's that's just outreach. Other people might say you're just trying to appease Marxists, um, you know, and uh, and so. So that that I think that the, the hashtag was probably the most problematic part of that. Um, I know that from the standpoint of a pure libertarian um, or an anarchist, you don't have to have, you know, no, nobody has an obligation to be explicitly anti-racist. But most people aren't racist and most people don't like racism. You know, so 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 I think that if it had been said without the hashtag, it would have been a lot less of a firestorm. Once you put the hashtag in there, then all of a sudden you have kind of created uh, a lot of furor, and you know that's what that's what people are people are going in on me. You know, I I've never been in the, in the Libertarian Party, um, and all the stuff that I've heard about Joe Jurgensen has been pretty good. So I would so my my thought process was that it was probably mostly just a way to get people to take a look, you know, because sometimes sometimes saying something that is a bit provocative or even slightly over the top as a way to have someone look at something that they would not have looked at otherwise. You know, it's a sales technique. So I looked at it as more of that than anything else. Uh, Trump does some of the same stuff. Um, I think that a lot of things that Trump oh. says are essentially just drawing attention, kind of a sales technique. Um, and 
so you shouldn't necessarily take it as being the worst thing that it could be. And almost nobody does mean right, the worst right, thing that right. you that, that you can imagine. You know, um, it seemed clumsy to me. It, mostly, it seemed yeah, clumsy. Yeah, it seemed very, yeah, it definitely seemed clumsy. I absolutely agree with that. It, it was it was a clumsy move. Um, yeah, it, that is. But like I said, that like I said, that is the thing when you start dealing with symbols. Symbols, you always have to be very careful when you just put up a symbol because people bring whatever baggage they got with it. You know, as we saw with things like Confederate monuments and things like that, that, that symbols mean, and they mean different things to different people. Um, you know, my, my family has never been a big fan of Confederate monuments. So, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't have any power to do anything about it, you know, and I see a lot of times people using what I would call bad arguments kind of all around. And that's not saying whether or not I agree or disagree with the thrust of what you're saying. But sometimes an argument is just bad. Like, you know, I've mentioned many times that when people say that uh, nobody said anything about the Confederate monuments, no, that's completely untrue. People said all kinds of stuff about it. And the people who didn't say anything about it didn't say anything about it because they were being governed by terrorists. I mean, what do you say when your government is, if your government's terrorist, you don't say anything that's anti-terrorist? <laughs> you know, so, so those people didn't say anything. You know, but but do not take uh, do not take being 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 uh, you know subjugated into being silent as being complicit being complicit with it. So so um, I think that that those kinds of things are really bad arguments. I think that a much better argument in my mind would be that there were certainly some people who, when they were putting up these symbols, were absolutely white supremacists. And a lot of times they they specifically said it. I would say that one of the things that has happened, though, is that for the most part, those people did not rear their children to be white supremacists. And those their children looked at those same symbols without the bad part of it. And I think that we should have some recognition for that kind of thing. Uh, and even I would say even to some degree, some sympathy for people who who were. I would say not great people in the past that if you're, if you don't read your children with the bad ideas, you did something, you did something better than some people did. You know, and I can say that a lot of people, they didn't, they didn't rear, they didn't rear their children with the bad ideas. And the same thing even happens when it comes to people kind of attack the, the fundamental ideas of the United States that, uh, you know, okay, we can certainly say that slave owners, I mean, certainly all those things are terrible. And, uh, but, they did. Uh, they did set up. Uh, they did. They did. I guess you could say set up systems where people could get away from those things eventually. And there's something to be said for that. You know, I, I, uh, I would. And also to having just kind of the ideals in the first place. There's something to be said for that. If you're gonna have, if you're gonna have a system, the, would you rather have a system that has, lo, ha, has bad ideals that it always achieves or lofty ideals that it rarely does. You know, the lofty ideals at least can propel future generations into better things. If you got bad ideals from the rip, chances are the future generations are going to continue to achieve the same bad ideals that you had. So, you know, there's something to be said for that's actually a good thing. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't just say that, just dismiss all of that. My attitude to the statue business is, almost the same as free speech ideas. You know, the, the best response to speech you don't like is more speech. So mm -hmm. the best response to statues you don't like is more statues. More statues, okay, yeah. And, and I, can certainly, I can certainly agree with that. I, and, you know, even- And even I'd like to see more statues, by the way. I'd actually like to, this, this would be actually kind of fun. So would I. I think that it is, I think that it is, it, you know, I think that we should have a lot more statues. I mean, Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman are among the greatest Americans ever to have lived, in, in my opinion. And I don't think that they, uh, I think that a lot of times they're given lip service, um, but they certainly don't have anything like uh, the statues that a lot of other people do. And, uh, and you know, and even people who are more, more recent than Harriet Tubman, I, I would say that you know, it would be hard for me to imagine um, any, let's see, who, Harriet Tubman might be the greatest person ever to come from the state of Maryland. When it comes to um, this racism thing, I guess we're, we're I guess we're there. Um, libertarian ideas to me seems like we're, we, we defend the rights of racists of all races. And so <laughs> I'm less interested in anti-racism as a particular libertarian thing. But I look at racism as a vice. Like mm -hmm. I look at greed as a vice. 
like I look at envy as a vice. And right. certainly we can, we can all be against vice. Mm -hmm. And probably we all should be. Though we can also have fun with it, too. I mean, there's nothing funnier than a greedy person on stage. You know, <laughs> I mean, there, but real greed, I mean, killed millions of people in the Americas because, I mean, that's what De Las Casas said what the Spaniards were doing. It was greed that drove them to kill millions of Indians. And he, he didn't say it was anything else. It wasn't hatred for them as, as such. They certainly enjoyed killing them. I mean, the stories are just fantastically ugly. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been reading it recently. I've been reading about the conquest of Americas, and this is truly gruesome stuff. I mean, beyond even our conceptions of what could happen. And mm -hmm. um, I shake my head at it, but that was greed. He, he basically, he point and blank, he said it was greed, and they, there was reasons for it. They also emptied up the uh, prisons of Spain and gave them license to go about in the New World. So that's an interesting technique. And that's something we didn't happen in, in our part of America. It's always kind of, kind of amazing to me when you hear people make what I consider very sweeping statements about how things are worse. And I'm like, man, crack open a book. Good God, you have no idea. I mean, <laughs> I mean just the kind of horror stories of, uh, of uh, that people have inflicted on other people. It's it's yeah yeah it's it's it pretty amazing. I mean it, it's amazing to me. I mean like I said, I'm not a super emotional guy, but it's amazing to me that 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 people would do some of the stuff that they've done, and not only just do it, enjoy it. Oh yeah yeah obviously. I've been reading about Genghis Khan recently, and he was a truly a, a genius. He was an amazing person, and it's certainly worth reading about him kill millions of people i mean it's astounding what he did his, oh yes <laughs> i mean yeah the, i mean depopulating areas you know i mean uh yeah we, yeah we, i mean i think it said what 50 million chinese people or so um were killed by 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 at, at, over over the course of his conquest i know that um I remember listening to a podcast by Dan Carlin where he was talking about how he wrote this paper in history class that was kind of uh, praising G uh, Genghis Khan a bit, like talking about like he, he invented um, diplomatic immunity and he opened up trade routes and things like that. And his history, he said his history professor was of uh, Chinese ancestry and his history professor gave him an F and, and told him why. And he had never considered kind of the, the other side of that. You know, because we look at this sort of great man history and all of the people are just things to us, you know, because yeah. there's much distance they're, they're They're just things. And for the people who were, uh, uh, the, you know, the kin of those folk, that's they look at that, that very differently as they very well should. And, you know, and, and ha us having a, a kind of a broader appreciation for you know, the, the cost that people inflict on others, you know, that's something that, that should always be kept in mind. And we should keep it in mind before we do stuff today, you know, because we talk about a lot of things like, uh, you know, we just do this and this will happen. And we don't think about who this is being done to. I have this old lore about Genghis Khan is an old, just an old bit of dialogue. I don't know if it's true but I'm going to repeat it anyway because it's such a wonderful little story. Genghis Khan commanded his armies to slaughter every Manchurian, all of them, and make Manchuria a place to breed horses. And his uh, advisor said, you know, we can get more wealth if we tax them. And they were saved to be tax slaves. <laughs> yes. Well... <laughs> I mean, there's that. Yeah, well, I mean, there's certainly something to be said for that. You know, I, I think that maybe, um, you know, you actually you make you make me think that that might be another kind of side benefit of of this sort of increased ability to communicate is that that does mean that you have a better ability to levy taxes so that these targets of your conquest now become useful in a way other than just you know, you slaughter them all and making space. Well, now we actually we actually have a little bit of infrastructure. We kind of know how to read and write. We know, I would imagine that the that the wars in in the world prior to writing 
were far worse because you wouldn't have the ability to just say, hey, you need to pay this. Y'all don't even have the ability to communicate. Just kill them all. I don't know what these what these people are. They don't speak out like us. They don't look like us. Kill all of them and we'll just take over this area. I imagine that would probably be the normal thing to do. Uh, but, you know, when you get into the area where you have the ability to, to, to read, write, to send edicts to people who are in charge of these other places, I'm sure that, that probably saved a large chunk of humanity uh, in terms of percentages of deaths, you know, uh, yeah, I'm sure that with the rising population, more people still died. But I'll bet you as a percentage of the population, it was probably lower. So social change is complicated. It is. And we're going through it now. You know, I think that that uh, Americans in particular, a lot of Americans kind of kind of came up in the it's kind of a post-war bubble of sorts to where the United States came out of World War Two with such a head start, the rest of the world was bombed back to the Stone Age almost, and we were the world's bank and the world's manufacturing facility, so that a lot of the things that that uh, had been taken for granted before had changed. I think that that, I think that World War II had as much to do with ending racism in the United States as anything, maybe more than just about everything, for a couple of, for a few reasons. It, it a lot of black, uh, black men in particular came back from war uh, having a lot more desire to to have rights and property, and they had been trained in arms, and and had been trained in in had been trained in coordinating efforts. Because one of the things that 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 uh, that traditional black culture, as it had been handed down from slave owners, was not conducive to blacks con- coordinating. Uh, efforts among each other. That's uh, not unless they came from um, one centralized, accepted authority that you should not ever say anything up against. There was no concept that we're going to discuss, have brainstorms about what's the best way to accomplish things and coordinate actions. That really was not so common until after the war. And I think that the war had a lot to do with that. And then the other thing is that with an economy that's expanding as much as the U.S. economy was, Racism became extremely costly in a very obvious way for the first time to where, you know, if you if you denied people jobs and whatnot, then all of a sudden I can't make as much money. And it's real obvious right now. It's not one of those things to where it happens slowly over the course of generations or anything like that. This happens right now. My competition goes up on me. I go out of business. So that changed more attitudes than just about anything. And I think that for it might be kind of a, an uncomfortable discussion when you start talking about real hardcore libertarians because you're, you're basically saying, okay, well, this war had these positive effects uh, or things that we regard as positive. Um, and, you know, but, but I, think that, I think that it absolutely had just a pretty substantial effect. I, I, I think that probably the freest the country ever was really was in the 1970s, um, kind of uh, towards the, as far as freedom. That's not necessarily say that was the time you most want to live, because there's technology, there's all kinds of things you got to consider. But in terms of interference from the state, it's hard for me to imagine anything much, much better than the U.S. prior to the, um, the kind of the ignition of the drug war. Um, and I would say really the Reagan drug war more so than the Nixon. The Nixon one definitely did some stuff, but uh, it really cranked up on the Reagan and that radically changed kind of freedom. Um, it, it allowed, I think it allowed police officers, the police departments to kind of continue using Jim Crow tactics, but now have non Jim Crow reasons for doing it. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a horrible aspect of what's going on in our, in our adult lives is what's happened since then. And people don't recognize just how pernicious and how decaying to the what we think of as American institutions, that is, checks and balances, rule of law. The war on drugs didn't do anything for the war, uh, rule of law. It, it was just absolutely devastating. And then for poorer communities, it was just completely awful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it was one of those things that it undermined it undermined state legitimacy more than anything that a libertarian could have imagined to do. I mean, it, it made people, it made a large chunk of the country really hate the state. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the, and the problem, some, the quote unquote problem with that is that sometimes some of the things that the state does, it causes people to hate the state, but not for the right reasons. <laughs> and then, and then what ends up happening is 
that when you kind of push back on that, you you have you have all of the, you have you have all of these ideas that you're now trying to implement, you know, because it wasn't about that the state is doing these terrible things because it's violating rights. You know, it was because maybe this was racist. So now that we need to counteract it with uh, with some race preferences or something like that, or uh, maybe it's uh, or um uh, it, or it's not you're not thinking about it in terms of well the federal government has too much power. It's just that it's using the power in the wrong way. And you know there's no there's no right way. You're not gonna in the long term you're not gonna have the right way to have centralized power because it's always going to attract people who are bad. It's always going to attract people who want to 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 dominate others to do uh, to just you know to there's always that that sort of lust to dominate and um, those kinds of people are going to be attracted to the state every time uh, in the era before you had all of these communications that I'm talking about, those people were so uh, often attracted more to the state governments because the state governments had more functional power to dominate an individual um, in the world kind of, uh, you know, post communications where everybody can, can, can tell their story and, and people can experience outrage wherever you are, that has kind of shifted more to the federal government has, has, has the power to, to do, these, do these kind of things. But you're always going to be attracting these, these unsavory folk into any kind of power structure like that. So, and I think that probably the communications era is going to make it clear that that is the case. It's one of, uh, my question now is whether or not it's just going to be are we going to be learning just through iterations of failures or are we going to learn that, okay, this underlying assumption is bad. I don't know that, you know, so it might just be that you just got failure after failure after failure after failure after failure until just about everything has been tried and then just <laughs> you figure out that nothing actually works. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. There's a great line from Benjamin Tucker. Evolution can be said to be leading us to Liberty in the sense that it's tried every other direction and made a failure of it. Yes. And, and, and I do think that that is, that is the case. Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that you hear people complaining about, just various forms of either real oppression or of inconvenience, whatever it is. Um, a lot of times, it comes down to okay, I don't perceive myself as having a lot of options. So when you cut off this option, it really is something that hurt that that I feel very deep. And the best way to fix that problem is not to force people open, it's to give you more options, to allow more options to enter into the market so that so that and you don't feel like you don't feel helpless, so that you feel like, OK, if this person is cutting off a door, there's 40 more doors out here. That's your loss more than mine. That's 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 the world that ideally you want to have. And, you know, I think that it is going to get there. I, I think that that a stateless world is inevitable. Um, which is not to say that it's going to be a world without rules. I think it's going to have a lot of rules. A matter of fact, I think that some of those rules will be a good bit more restricted than what we have today. But it will be a stateless. I have two problems that I see immediately when I think about this. One yeah. is the federal government and the, most of the welfare states of the world have huge amounts of debt, which has destructured the whole economy. And I don't even understand how we get out from under it. it it's very, very, it makes me cringe when I think about it. I wonder if some of the reasons we're not crazy right now is a result of the fact that everybody knows that this is a problem but can't deal with it. What do you do? What do you do when you know this is a problem and you just can't deal with it? You go little bats. Yeah. Hmm. That's an interesting. I don't know if it's true, but it's it's just one of my working theories. The other problem I have is that states today and having so much possibility to influence, the power that the individual has is corrupting as well. That's one of the problems of policy in a democracy is that people want to live at the expense of everybody else. Yes, they do. And that's a real issue. And I don't know how to deal really well with that either, because how do you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, there are certainly some, some serious, some serious cultural problems because cultures develop within the context of their environment. Exactly. And so when we have this environment of the state, which is kind of creaking at the, uh, you know, at the, at the edges and whatnot and may crumble. If that crumbles, then you're going to have people who are culturally unequipped to deal with whatever it is, whatever it is that's there. And yeah, that is a problem. I don't think that there, I definitely do not think there's any kind of, uh, of, of, of easy answer there. I have no idea what it's going to look like. I would say that probably the best chance we have for, 
for to come out of that without there being disasters is to is to push the free market into more and more government functions. And when I say free market, I don't mean privatizing to a monopoly. You got to actually open it up to competition because it's going to be people with people on the ground essentially seeing what problems are out there and what resources are out there who are going to figure out these these solutions because I certainly can't. Um, but I, I, I think that in the long run, that's the only way that you're going to have this come out without there being some really bad, massive, you know, like stuff like famines and stuff. Like I, I can envision a world where you would even have famines in the modern world, which is kind of crazy to think about when you when you think about uh, the world that we live in. The the market has has in the in the developed world has eliminated famine, you know, Um you know, if you want to see one of the big differences in how how uh, governments uh, deal with problems and the effects of modern modern economy, you can you can look at that. You know, if you look at the at the uh, biblical story with seven years of feast and seven years of famine, you would you know during the during this feast time you'd buy up a bunch of stuff and store it all up, and then when you got your famine, you'd be able to distribute it to the people and all this. Whereas the free market has just made food so abundant that the famine just never happens. Just that's just not a thing. <laughs> I must say that my girth is now a testament to this. <laughs> Same here. So, yes, yeah, so I think that and I think that that's another thing, too, is that the state solutions to these problems, kind of like the state solution to famine may look very different from the free market solution to the same problem. The free market solution might look completely different from what the state has been doing. Right. It may, and, and that's one of the reasons why I say open it up to competition. I don't think that having a company take over the, the functions of the state and doing things in the way that the state did it. I mean, sometimes that can be a, uh, an incremental improvement, but the real improvement comes when you got a bunch of minds thinking about, well, what is this underlying problem? And what is an alternative way to think about it? That's where the geniuses come into play. And you have people who, who will come up with ways that I, would, I can't even imagine to solve problems that I think that there's only one way to solve it. And so, you know, that ultimately markets are, are the answer to everything because then you got a bunch of people thinking about a problem, you know, and that's that's what you what you come. Yeah, yeah. You have distributed yeah. power, distributed responsibility, distributed genius. Yeah. And you have you have people taking on the the cost of failure. And, and, and I think that one of the one of the most. One of the one of the things that is that is easy to have sympathy for, but which is actually the most destructive is the state's tendency to try to uh, try to shield people from negative consequences. And because a lot of times negative consequences aren't necessarily your fault, but it's still a consequence. You know, so I mean, if I if I was to go out today and there just be some freak media that comes and hit my car and kills me, that's not my fault, but it's a consequence of me going out. I should, you know, it, it, the, the way to fix that would not be to, well, we have a way of shielding you from this meteor at the cost of hurting all kinds of other people and stuff that, and which is kind of what the state ends up doing. It's like, no, I understand that it is not their fault and there's no blame here, but by allowing the natural consequences of you say going into business or you trying an idea and it failing and it actually failing means that someone come along, learn from your mistakes do it better the next time. We're not propping up a bad idea. We're saying, okay, well, that bad idea, it just doesn't work, you know? And, and, and it might not even be that the idea is intrinsically bad or whatever. It just may be inappropriate for this specific situation, you know, or it might be ill-timed. It could be anything, but it's appropriate that those are, that, that, that you suffer the negative consequences so that other people can see, okay, that didn't work. What did what happened that was wrong? What did they do wrong? Or was there something about the, the, the market they were entering that they didn't that they didn't understand? Is there something I can do better? That that the ability to iterate is an is an important part of, of markets and culture. And that's another thing, going back to the IP thing, that IP kind of helps to shut down. And that's one that's another reason why it's bad. Okay. I think that's a podcast. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. I thank Robert for joining me for this, the 19th episode of the Local Folk Netcast, the podcast that begins with the striking of a match, which is how the Local Folk movement of the 1830s began, too. The Local Folkers were the first coherent libertarian movement in American history, perhaps the history of the world. And we strike the match not to burn things down, but to light fresh fires of the mind, as Sam Adams said so long ago. My name is Timothy Workman Verkula, and some old-timers may remember me from my initials, TWV, 
in Liberty Magazine, published out of Port Townsend, Washington, from 1987 to 1999. You can find me on my blog, at workman.com, or on social media, such as gab.com, under the moniker, at workman. That's workman with an I, not an O. The team can be reached at locofoco.us and at locofoco.locals.com. The podcast is hosted at locofoco.net and can be accessed via podcatchers such as Apple, Google, Pocket Cast, and Spotify. Video versions of the podcast are uploaded to YouTube, and I have channels at BitChute and Brideo. The latter unmentionable on Facebook, I kid you not. We live in interesting times. So, until next time, keep interested. Thank you. Thank you.